Hey everyone, my name is Michael Seiger and I'm the founder and publisher of i6sigma.com, the largest community of lean and Six Sigma professionals in the world and the resource for learning to drive breakthrough improvement. Here's what we do here. We bring on successful lean and Six Sigma business leaders, learn from their experiences and share their strategies and tactics. Then when you have a success to share, you can come on the show and give back as today's guest is going to do. We're going to go a little out of the typical corporate world today and talk about America's favorite pastime, baseball. The question we're going to answer today is, why haven't we seen a 400 hitter in Major League Baseball in 70 years? Joining me to answer this question is Roger Hart, the author of Pivotal Swing, How to Fundamentally Change the Game of Baseball. And here's a copy of it. You can see it. This is uh, the first version that's out. It's changed slightly. Uh, Roger retired from a successful career as Director of Quality Systems and Six Sigma Deployment at Sony Electronics and decided to turn his attention to solve a sports problem plaguing athletes and managers for decades. And he's here to share it with us and tell us how he did it. Roger, welcome to the show. Howdy. Good to be with you. Roger, we're going to start at the beginning, so anyone, even those not rabid baseball fans like yourself, watching the show can understand what you did, why it's significant, and how they can solve problems they face every day in their lives. So let's start with this question. What does it mean to be a 400 hitter? Uh, it's uh, merely an aspect of statistics. It's how often do you get a hit out of the number of times you go to bat. So a 400 hitter means four out of 10 times you go to bat, you get a hit. And that's not just hitting the ball, but it's you know getting a hit that's classified by baseball as a hit, which sometimes uh, it's kind of a strange situation because sometimes the hitter will hit the ball really screwy and it ends up being a hit when other times they hit the ball really well and it's an out. So it's kind of- So if uh, I get up to bat yeah. 10 times in a game, I pop fly, it to first base and they catch it every single time i'm a zero hitter right because all 10 times they were caught but if yep. i but if i bunt it and i get to first base all 10 times then i'm a thousand hitter correct okay so we're talking about a 400 four out of 10 doesn't seem like uh a, a uh, statistic that would be hard to do why is it so hard to be a 400 hitter well, this is actually this is one of the things that I think is very interesting because in business, you know, like in a, a manufacturing business, if we had a process that yielded less than 98 percent, we thought the world was coming to an end. <laughs> and uh, in this kind of environment, you know, hitting uh, even hitting 300 is considered quite remarkable to many. Uh, it's just uh, uh, it's very hard. Uh, gentlemen, one of the famous baseball players, Ted Williams, coined a phrase and that is. Baseball is the hardest thing to do in all of sports, the hardest single thing to do in all of sports. And there's been, uh, if, you, if you Google that, you'll, you'll find millions and millions of hits on the internet about the, the topic of what's the most difficult thing to do in sports. But the vast majority of sports writers and people over the years have basically agreed that hitting a baseball in Major League Baseball, you know, I mean, not Little League, but right. in Major League Baseball is considered the hardest thing to do in all the sports. So that's that's why it's uh, it's hard. So who was the last person to hit 400? Uh, it actually was Ted Williams. Now, I live in San Diego, and, and it's interesting. Ted Williams was actually from San Diego. And uh, the really interesting side note is, is that my father-in-law actually played on the same high school baseball team as Ted Williams. Wow. Was, was he really, a great hitter uh, back in high school as well? Out. Yeah. Was he a great hitter back in high school? Um, no, no, hit, uh, my my father-in-law was actually a pitcher. So most pitchers are not good hitters, and, and he really wasn't. But uh, uh, Ted Williams was. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so what – so I understand from you that the last person to hit – a 400 was Ted Williams 70 years ago. Most athletes today probably hit, what, 200, 250? Probably uh, to, be in the, to be a major on a major league team now, what they call in the show, 
you you pretty much have to be a 250 hitter at least. Okay. Uh, and if you're hitting but, 300, you're a rock star. Most people, the people that hit over 300 are uh, highly paid. They they make their contracts are millions of dollars more than people that hit 250. Wow. Okay. Um, and so, what benefit? Clearly, that's one benefit. But what benefits would athletes and teams have if they had one 400 hitter on their team? You know, in, clearly the individual you just said they could make millions more per season if they hit a three. 10, 320 over a 250 that they're hitting this season? Well, this is kind of, uh, actually, this is probably one of the controversies uh, uh, amongst those in the game of baseball today. And uh, you have to realize baseball is entertainment. It fits into a category of entertainment more than it does uh, the game or more than it does the business. Right. So if you classified as business you're really classifying it as the entertainment business right so you can have a uh, a very uh, I don't know if you know the name of Rodman in basketball I mean they're just a wild and crazy guy it's and, all tattooed uh, up he, crazy yeah. hair says crazy and he, things. He, he draws crowds yeah and it has nothing to do with how good of a ball player he is to, right. so to speak so it, in baseball you still have to be conscious right now if you really get down to brass tacks, they, they often call it small ball. And that is you brought up bunting or whatever. A lot of teams uh, don't really want to play small ball because they think that the crowd doesn't uh, like it. Uh, but they also don't like it when there's a pitching duel and two pitchers are out there and they're just, uh, you know, nobody's getting any hits and mm -hmm. everything either. So because it reduces the entertainment value of people getting to see fantastic hits or seeing fantastic defensive plays being made and stuff like that so it, it uh, to me the, the biggest issue is is that we're back to the statistics because I am a, a I am a process guy so yeah uh, the statistics are that the team that hits more is gonna win more games they're just I mean it's just uh, you know it's a mathematical fact that if you get more hits you're gonna win more games now there has been a trend to where people have been trying to hit the ball harder in other words more home runs mm -hmm. there uh, I would still from a from a personal standpoint I firmly believe that the team that focuses on general hitting and not focusing on home runs will always be the prevailing winning team well and then this this shows out in the statistics that the team that wins the league is basically always the team that has the highest batting average and can you also say that the team that has the most action on the field that actually gets hits, that runs bases, produces more entertainment for the fans? Uh, all I can do on that is give you my personal perspective. Yeah. That's my personal perspective. I would much rather go to a game. Uh, in the book, I referred to the uh, Juan Marichal, uh, Warren Spahn and Marichal duel that they had. It was like 56 uh, each uh, pitcher faced 56 batters, and it was just a huge pitching duel. But I, I, in the book, I just all I said is that's that's a great way to look at the game. But I consider that a pure failure of hitting. All it is is just nobody had the capability to hit well, and right. that that was partly you know from my standpoint is this whole issue of why haven't we had good hitters is because that. I believe that's what the game is about. It's more yeah, that. I agree. And, you know, if, if you won't say it, I'll say it because I know very little about baseball compared to you or compared to, you know, uh, any of the other th millions of fans, tens of millions of fans around the U.S. But I grew up going to Dodgers games and I'm living up here in Seattle and I go to Mariners games. We used to have season tickets and I want to see action. I love to go see hockey games because I always know there's going to be action on the floor. Maybe there'll be a fight or two. But the, the buck is definitely going to go all over the place. And I'm going to see people working hard, showing me that they're a professional athlete and showing me, like, what they can do that's remarkable. And when right. I go to a baseball game, I want to see action. I don't want to sit in the same seat and uh, watch a bunch of pitches, go over the plate, and then change uh, the inning. It, yeah. That's not exciting to me. No, I agree. So um, – what would it do to the game of baseball if every team had something like five, four hundred hitters per per team? Well, this is kind of interesting uh, uh, question because 
when I wrote, when I was applying to the patent office for the trademark for the title, uh, when I told them that my uh, the book was Pivotal Swing and it was descriptive of the of the swing method, they said, "Well, we can't issue you a trademark for that." I said, "Yeah, okay, but what it also is is it's descriptive of what it's going to do to the game, because if you can change a core level process of hitting, if you can change that by twenty percent." The whole game changes because any team, you know, it, it literally, if you have a tw an improvement of twenty percent, if that will take the bottom team all the way to the top, right? And and it will just change the whole foundation of perspective. And then you have a situation where, if one team doesn't even uh, adopt, say, that new method, then they're never going to win. It. They're never going to win. They're, they're going to be. They're, they'll still play the game, but they're never going to win. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's like it's the pivotal, cars that it's, it's like the cars the that game. were built that didn't that weren't built with quality. You know, everybody when Toyota was taken off, everybody wanted a Toyota high quality, high uh, uh, efficiency vehicle that they knew was dependable, and and they right. started out selling all the American cars, and the Americans had to catch up, and a lot of them didn't make it. Yep. All right, Roger. So we're gonna dig into exactly how you fix this problem, exactly where you're going with that, why you actually got a trademark and you've got a patent on this. I'm gonna dig into that. But before we dig into everything and how you solve the problem, I wanna take a step back. I mentioned in the introduction that you spent part of your professional career at Sony Electronics as Director of Quality Systems and Six Sigma Deployment. How long did you spend with Sony? Well, actually, I was with Sony twice. <laughs> uh, I was uh, with them about uh, 10, 10 or 11 years once, and then I left for a while, and then I came back and was with them for another 12 years after that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I did many different things there, mostly in, in the environment of manufacturing, manufacturing engineering, quality, quality systems, and eventually getting the quality systems moving into uh, how did Six Sigma fit into the picture, you know? Yeah. And uh, and your latest role uh, with Sony before you retired was director of quality systems and in charge of their Six Sigma deployment. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. What would you consider your biggest accomplishment at Sony related to Six Sigma and process improvement? Well, to me, the the role that I had was is I actually wasn't uh, doing as much individual Six Sigma as I was with co coordinating the deployment. Mm -hmm. In that deployment, we went from basically having nobody involved in understanding what Six Sigma was to where we had six master black belts who were actually able to do all of the training after a while. We had uh, over 300 black belts and we had over 2,000 green belts. Wow. Plus, we had many, uh, I don't really actually have a number, but met probably in the hundreds of champions and uh, leadership people that were uh, exposed to an understanding that they had a significant role. To me, the biggest problem you have in the deployment into a company like that is, is you have to have leadership from the top. If you're, and we'll get into this, I'm sure later too, but change to a company is just so huge and you can't affect change if the leadership isn't really fully on board and leading the way. Yeah. And so anybody that knows how Six Sigma is deployed at large corporations or or the typical successful deployment, it's top down. It needs a leader like yourself to organize all the Six Sigma um, processes, how their how metrics are tracked, how projects are executed, selected and executed and and doing all the training and and uh, rewards and recognition to ensure that you're changing the culture of the organization. Um, do you have uh, metrics around how much? productivity savings or cost savings you uh, delivered during your time as Six Sigma director? Yes, uh, I, I do have one. There, Because the projects were so varied, especially at the beginning, it was mostly manufacturing, but mm -hmm. we'll talk about maybe later too, is one of my biggest challenges was how to get the non-manufacturing, the transactional type people involved with Six Sigma too. But the, the metric that we came up with was savings, uh, the, the big master thing that we used and we tracked it. We had a database and tracked all the projects and we tracked savings. And we, uh, and in the first three years of our major deployment, we had just under uh, $500 million in savings. 
Wow. And is that, you know, I know there's a lot of calculations around hard savings and soft savings. And yeah. um, it, it, would you classify that as all in or? That's hard savings. Hard savings. So you hard actually savings. remove that cost from the manufacturing line or you, you uh, reduce the need for capital expenditures or things like that. Right. We, we had two categories that we really tried to focus on. We, we call it top line and bottom line. Top line is you increased sales mm -hmm. or bottom line is you eliminated costs or reduced waste. Mm -hmm. Great. And does one project stick out in your mind more than any other, Roger? And I know that you weren't in charge of the individual projects, but you, you led the deployment. So you, you had you know, overall responsibility. All the projects rolled up to you and you get to oversee them and you work with the executive team. Does any one project stick out in your mind? It's like, wow, that, that really displayed the power of Lean Six Sigma at Sony. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do have one that I would classify as that. Uh, but I feel a little bit, uh, uh, no, I don't know, a little bit worried about the fact that if I make, by making this statement, the, the vast majority of the projects and especially in the early stages, all of the development and work by the manufacturing folks was really the, the core of the, the deployment and m by far the uh, more people were trained and more projects were done and more savings were achieved and so forth through that. But over the years, I think more transactional things would have started to show mm -hmm. up too. We, we still had a lot of savings in the transactional. Yeah. But to me, the, the project that was the, the most, uh, I, I guess, the more, most eye-opener to us and maybe even to the management folks was a, a project in accounts payable. In, in, I mentioned earlier, you know, in a manufacturing environment, if you have a process that yields less than 98%, you, you just really, you come unglued. I mean, man, top management of the company is, they're down on the production line. They're ranting and raving and yelling and screaming about what the heck's going on. Why are these, why do we have these problems? Well, what happened was in the accounts payable department, uh, we have a system, we had a system where when you purchase something and it comes in and you receive it and you accept it and then you uh, get it deployed to the uh, first to the warehousing and then from warehousing to production and stuff, we, we had a system for what we called the accounts payable system. Mm -hmm. when, when they looked at that, when we finally convinced them that they needed to work in, in this area, they went in and they measured what's called the first pass yield. Mm -hmm. All right, the first pass yield is how often when an invoice comes in, does that invoice go in, have all the elements necessary, and it gets paid basically by the computer? Mm -hmm. We found it to be less than 30%. <laughs> so very typical, very uh, similar to the yield of batters in Major League Baseball. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but but in a menu, but here's a situation where in a man in a big company. We have one side of the company in manufacturing that 98% is the is the yield number that if you don't achieve it, everybody comes unglued. Right. And here's another part of the company that's literally, you know, stumbling and and uh, redoing work and wasting energy and time and money, and nobody's even paying attention to it. Nope. You know, so it was it was to me that was the biggest eye opener. We were able with a you know through combination of getting some people trained working on that and and it wasn't and that was an example of a quite diverse kind of a project because you had to tie into purchasing you had to tie into receiving you had to tie into quality departments you had to tie into the mm -hmm. warehousing people yep. and you had to tie into the accounting and, and the payable system so there were a lot of different facets to the project in order to address why are we having all these problems if you write the PO wrong of course, the product's going to show up wrong. So, yeah. you know, you've got to fix that too. You can't just assume you're going to get Six Sigma results when you don't have Six Sigma processes. Exactly. And that's a lot of waste and a lot of cost. And people look at it as job security, uh, you know, fixing all these errors. But, uh, you know, it, it happens in every business, in every environment. Uh, and I faced it at GE for, you know, over a decade. I was at GE when Jack Welsh rolled it out and we saw it yeah. in our accounts payable and our accounts receivable. And, every single department and you know people think well I don't like change but life and work is so much more enjoyable when you do things right the first time and you take pride in your work and you don't have to fix errors all day long 
Yep. Yeah. All right. So let's dig into this, Roger. Anyone that understands Six Sigma knows that it's a roadmap for solving any problem. The acronym DMAIC, DMAIC, uh, stands for Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, and Control. Uh, and it's what you use to solve the hitting problem. As a quick overview, you define the problem that you're trying to solve. You collect data to measure the problem. You analyze the data you collected to understand it and look for the root cause or causes. You improve the process to eliminate the defects that cause that uh, uh, the defects that cause the the um, uh, low results that you're experiencing. And then you put in process, uh, put your process in control so that it doesn't degrade again. So let's run through each of the steps of how you solved the hitting problem and then what that solution looked like. So let's start with define. What was the definition of your problem when you when you thought about solving hitting in, in baseball? Well, I think it's, I started from the basic element of why haven't we had a 400 hitter? Mm -hmm. that, that was sort of the driving I mean, my, I started helping my son, and that was when I originally, you know, way, way many years actually before I actually took on the final project. But uh, the, the key to me was <clears throat> why, why is management accepting such a low uh, performance level? Mm -hmm. Because in my belief, it can be higher. And, uh, you know, Kimley, Dr. Kimley, for example, one of the things he really beat into me was, you know, you as a manager, you got to learn to ask the right questions. And to me, the right question is not um, sort of, you know, what's wrong, but the question is, why can't we get better hitting? Yeah. And, I, and, and then when I started to analyze and look at that and develop the desire to pursue it, uh, I, I really said, you know, to me, it is, I'm going to view it as that this is the low batting average is reflective of a failure of hitting. And hit, pit, the pitching has improved over the years, but mm -hmm. hitting hasn't. So I consider that a failure of hitting to to develop and match the changes that are being made with pitching. And I truly, truly believe that I could find ways to improve it. So and what that's was that? why you know I had the desire and I had the will. So I wanted to go after how do we address that subject. Okay, so you define the problem as why haven't we had a hitter above 400? Your your uh, your measurements were 10 at bats, and your defect rate was um, you know if the average batter is uh, uh, 250, your your uh, defect rate was uh, 750, you know 7.5 times out of 100. Right. It was a defect. They weren't getting a hit. Right. And you define, so the, just like we did at the beginning of the interview, you define what a hit was. It's not just pop fly that, that's uh, out. That's not a hit. So you define right. what a hit was. Right. So for me, the, the, the probably the most important element in the, uh, the define phase for me was developing, and at this point it was actually refining the, the IPO or the input process output diagram. That to me became the real core level coordination and it re and I revised it many many times during the overall process of, of working on this because I had different perspectives at one time than at other times mm -hmm. but defining what were the key outputs and again based upon my education and my tr learning was my objective in the project was how do I improve the outputs mm -hmm. the desired outputs and not increase the undesirable outputs in, in in this process right so the IPO gave me that focus in addition I used uh, FMEA okay I don't want to get ahead Roger so okay. let, let me let me hold you for one second so we've defined the first phase of Demaic is defined the D so we've defined the definition of the problem I want to go through measure analyze improve and control and I want to find out each of those and I think you're using a lot of the tools in in analyze and improve and I want to hold off for a second before we get there so the second phase is measure. And so measurement it seems like, it, and I'll just throw this out, it seems pretty easy. The statistics, baseball, there's no other game that has as many statistics as baseball. Um, maybe football. They, they throw out crazy statistics yeah. in football. You know, we yeah. haven't seen a, a tight end run this back, and you know. But baseball yeah. has a ton of statistics. Um, and you know 
for every single player, for every single team, for every single season, for, you know, uh, everything, what the batting averages are. So, you know, that you can go look it up and you can see that the average um, hitting is, you know, 240 in the American League or whatever it is. Yeah. So yep. was that your measurement or did you have to go out and gather data on the problem and show that like, hey, we haven't seen a hitter in, in uh, 70 years that hit above 400. Well, actually, I could go just look up the statistics and like that's your measurement. Well, for me, the measurement phase was not so much the uh, that statistic aspect. To me, it was a given. Hitting batting average was the given. That was the focus of what are we going to address. Mm -hmm. To me, the measurement was more in gathering data about hitting. Mm. What causes hitting? What are the uh, so? So what I did was is I uh, went. There's a program uh, on TV called Baseball Tonight. Mm -hmm. I set up my video recorder so that every day that program would record and during that session uh you know uh it would they would typically show you know many many hitting episodes a lot of good fielding episodes and stuff too but what the the good news was is that they typically were showing the good hits they typically were not showing the bad hits <laughs> right and and so for me the measurement phase was ma very much aspect of gathering all of the data associated with all of the hitting and getting it into an organized format where I can see it and use it because I can't go to every game. I can't go all over the country. So but how this, did you do that, Roger? How do you like look at every single batter that's playing a game tonight and take data about their their swing, their stance, and uh, whatever other factors you think were important? Well, see, that's, that's where, uh, you, you know, to me – you mentioned jumping out of the uh, defined phase into the major phase. To me, I did look at the FMEA in the defined phase. And the reason I say mm -hmm. that is, is that because when you start to measure, mm -hmm. you want to know whether you're going to measure the right things. Right. And so I wanted to look at what are the possible causes, what are the more likely possibilities that would be affecting the outputs so that I would be more efficient in the utilization of my time spent measuring and, uh, and analyzing. Okay, so what factors did you determine were necessary for you to measure before you went and collected data? Well, what, what I uh, found out was, to me, the, in the output, uh, the key outputs of the, of the IPO were that accuracy and uh, precision of the bat placement were uh, most important. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I say that in contrast to the guys that are trying to hit home runs. Right. Those guys are swinging the bat very hard, but they're not able to put it on the ball. Exactly. There, we made clear differentiation at the start. We're talking about hitting. The problem is hitting. We want over 400. We're not talking about home runs. We're not talking about grand slams. You know, Right. So it's very clear that, that you're talking about that. But before we get into what were the significant factors, what were all the factors that you measured? Well, I, I didn't. I didn't at that point. I didn't have the uh, clear definitive. I had a list of outputs. Okay. The, the outputs were accuracy, timing, confidence, uh, balance, energy transfer, amount of time to execute the swing. Uh, were all of the uh, was the defined process being followed? You know, this mm -hmm. is a common thing in Six Sigma. Is you know, even once you set up the process, were the actual elements being followed? Type of right. thing. You know. So, uh, uh, and you mentioned about the hits. So, to me, even though hits are the most primary baseball statistic that they use, I, I this is when I get into this is, and I say this in the book too is is that my feeling is that uh, the hitting coaches and or the management of the teams are actually following the wrong statistic. Hmm. What they need to be looking at is the energy transfer hitting. How well are they hitting and precision and the energy transfer, not whether they get a hit. Because if the guy is hitting the ball really well, he's going to get hits. The fact that he happened to hit it right at the shortstop or he happened to hit it right at the left fielder, those are somewhat circumstantial and very, very minute one thousandth of a second difference in timing mm -hmm. factors. Mm -hmm. and, and those are very hard to control. But if you... If, and part of it, for example, when I was looking at that, I say, okay, well, is why why would I say accuracy is more important than balance? 
Well, the reason was is because I often saw a hitter that would place the bat perfectly on the ball, mm -hmm. not hit it really hard, but he would have perfect accuracy, poor balance. You know, he was fooled by a curveball or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. have poor balance, but still get a hit because he had the most important output, which was accuracy. Yeah. Okay. So when you identified all these factors and you watched, I, I assume that you watched <laughs> a, a good number of baseball games because you can't just watch the baseball tonight and look at all the hits that were done. You need to look at who's doing it well, who's not doing it well to gather all the data. Is that correct? Well, I, wa I watched uh, th what I'm calling hitting episodes, okay? Yeah. So I yeah. watched thousands of hitting episodes. So yes, uh, in addition to baseball tonight, then I would uh, videotape the game, mm -hmm. you know, especially when they were on the weekend or whatever days that yeah. they were showing the games. And I would watch the hitters in those games. I also I, I went to the pot I went to the Padre games a lot. Mm -hmm. I went to the San Diego Aztecs college games a, mm -hmm. a, a lot to watch in live conditions too. And I would actually videotape the, those myself. Mm -hmm. But the in the, those situations was. What I was doing was get, trying to gain the aspect because when you go to a game, most of the time the hitting's not good. The thing that was really beneficial about baseball tonight was I got to cap get captured in a very short time a lot of good hitting. Right. And when when I started to try to uh, when you get into what you know the ana analysis phase, then then there's some issues there that you can work with. Right. Yeah. And and how did you collect all this data? It's one thing to watch hundreds of games or thousands of games, Roger, and I can understand how painful that was to you <laughs> for a game that you love. But how do you actually record that data such that you can make an analysis of it later? Well, this this is where um, uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting was in my discussion with uh, Dr. Kimley, for example, when we were talking about whether he would, would write the foreword to the book and stuff was, we talked about the difference between a application of very sophisticated tools as opposed to the concept of initial when you first start working on a project your primary object objective is to reduce variation mm -hmm. you cannot get into a very sophisticated uh, design of experiments kinds of things when you don't have any control over the variation to start with right so uh, he was in complete agreement with me when I you said, you know, I really have to work with what I would call the more the front end, uh, simpler, less uh, sophisticated tools, the IPO, the FMEA, the pure logic, uh, problem solving is, is not uh, categorization and stuff. That's where I was focused on because I knew that I was taking this project on this is the first time anybody's ever looked at a professional sports performance process, and I, you know I shouldn't say that somebody I'm not, I know somebody's done some six sigma on golf, mm -hmm. but that's different because that's the, you know you're just you're standing still and there is a swing. But in, baseball is a lot different when you've got the ball is moving at 100 miles an hour and the, ba the hitter is trying to move at 70 or 80 miles an hour in the opposite direction and stuff. So right. Uh, to, to me, that was really a, a big issue was is that I knew that I wasn't going to be using sophisticated tools. So in this sense, what you're describing about the measurement, it's a little bit different. It's, it's not in uh, you know, high, you know, mic micrometer type of readings on a metal shaving or anything like that. This is how, how do you look at this basic process and how do we go about starting to reduce the variation? Yeah. yeah. So after you looked at all of these hundreds of thousands of, uh, of games and at-bats, what did you do with all of that information to, to then move into the next phase and analyze it and look for the root causes? Okay, this is, this is where the real work started. <laughs> what I had to do was I, would, I took each one of those, what I call them hitting episodes, okay, yeah. and I would go into slow motion I would analyze relative to the information that I had in connection with my outputs and within connection with my FMEA, looking at what were the things in that particular time, that episode, that stood out to me. You know, did the hitter, what did the hitter do? And uh, what happened when I started to do that, I mean, that was really tedious at first. Yeah. But as I made the list, 
what started to show up consistently, especially when I had the difference between watching a regular game and watching baseball tonight, was I started to see the difference of head movement. Mm -hmm. What really became obvious to me, when uh, the Padres brought in Ricky Henderson, for example, the year that he came to the Padres, the guy was you know, typically a 280 hitter for you know 15 years before he came to the Padres, and he, he just went kaput. He went to be a horrible hitter. If you watched him hit, it was totally obvious that he was moving his head all over the place, and that was why he had dropped down to a 240 hitter. Hmm. And it was very clear to me. But uh, the fact that he was even hitting 240 was, to a certain extent, amazing to me. <laughs> but the, he was such a fast runner. He's like uh, Ichiro for the Mariners. Well, yeah. actually, he's with the Yankees now. But he's like Ichiro was is that he, he can miss the ball and hit a really poor ball, but he can beat it out. Right. And so that's a different kind of why I feel that hitting – uh, the metric of getting base hits is actually, to me, not what hitting coaches should be using. They should be using energy transfer uh, because energy transfer directly relates to precision and it directly relates to uh, the precision of placement. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, you anyway, watched all I, these episodes. I, what I did was as I looked at those yep. videos and I, I started to see the pattern. The pattern of what was really key to the – what could I change was I had to change the swing – so that I would eliminate head movement mm -hmm. and improve the accuracy and energy transfer in the process. Okay, so the biggest thing was you watched all these episodes, head movement, low head movement uh, equated to more hits, high head movement equated to less hits, and then you said, how do we stop head movement? Yep. Okay, so that moves on to analyze. But before we get there, that's that's um, uh, to improve. But before we get to improve, that's analyze. So the, one of the first thing you said was head movement. Um, was there any other factors that you not noticed in all of these hitting episodes that was that was a factor involved in in um, improving uh, hitting? Well, the answer to that is yes, but it turned out that they were all linked to head movement. Mm -hmm. For for example, uh, uh, taking the stride. Every every hitting coach nowadays has in their element of teaching the hitter is they they teach taking the stride. Yeah. All right. Right. Well. The, the stride has, to me, two detrimental effects. One is, is that it makes your head move, but the worst one is, is that it forces you to decide what the pitch is before you know what the pitch is. Because if you take your stride associated with a fastball, you're gonna, your swing is going to be way out in front of a curveball. Right. Vice versa, if you decide the pitch is going to be a changeup and you take your stride and so that the ball's already passed you before you even started your swing. Right. And so for anybody so, that doesn't watch baseball, the stride is your front front foot moving forward so that you can get what what is arguably a little bit more uh, energy transfer on the ball because you're moving towards the ball. Yeah. Okay. And I, I'm saying yes to your statement, but I'm <laughs> disagreeing with the analysis being that the momentum – all this is what's so funny. All of the momentum comes from your hips and your rotation of your hips. It has nothing to do with the stride because if if you if you do, yeah, I, I should say that. For example, let's take golf. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see anybody teaching anybody to take a stride in golf. Nope. All of the momentum of the swing in golf comes from how you move the body, rotate right. through, and develop the head the head speed in the golf club. Right. That's that was an added perspective for me because I do understand golf too. Was that's why I I said you know eliminating the step is uh, or the stride is actually a key element because you are eliminating the head movement, but you're also building on that whole momentum of precision and accuracy because mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about you know two two tenths of a second to execute the swing all the way from the bat coming through to finishing and hitting the ball you got to do that in two tenths of a second and, and you you've got to be precise so in order to do that you've got to have some things working for you not have everything working against you right okay so you, you gathered all this, uh, this data, you were able to look at the data and see trends in the head movement, just like we described, high head movement, low hitting, low head movement, high hitting. Did you have enough data then to move into analyze and, and dig in further for the root causes? 
at that point? The answer to that is uh, I, it was probably in the analyze phase is where I really solidified on the factor that I needed to focus on uh, reducing, uh, uh, basically my term was eliminate head movement. My, yeah. my objective was to eliminate head movement and to design, change the swing mechanisms to be able to uh, literally prevent the head from moving as opposed to just reduce the head movement. Yeah, and, and you did a great job in, in the book describing that process. So basically, eliminate the head movement and, by, uh, and, and you did that by changing the swing path and by changing the stride or that little step with your, with your front foot. Was there anything else that you decided was necessary to change with the pivotal swing in order to, to uh, eliminate head movement? There were two, there were two more elements the, 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 besides those two that you mentioned. The next one was I lowered the bat mm -hmm. because, you know, if you see any batter go up to bat today, the bat is basically sticking straight up in the air. Mm -hmm. To me, in, in, in the whole concept of lean and Six Sigma is you want to eliminate waste. You want to eliminate anything that doesn't contribute to your output that you're trying to achieve. By lowering the bat, I was able to create the environment where the only thing the hitter has to do is move the bat forward. He doesn't have to control lowering it. He doesn't have to control how much. He doesn't have to have an angle involved or anything. He just bring the bat straight forward. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the two. The second one was is that I created the pivotal axis. This is the whole key to the name of the swing and the patent and, and the whole the whole thing focuses around this is I created the pivotal axis and w the purpose for creating the pivotal axis was to solidify the elimination of the head movement mm -hmm. so if you're not taking a stride you can create the pivotal axis to start with you pivot the body basically around the axis mm -hmm. the head is on the axis so it's not moving mm -hmm. and you pivot and bring the bat to the ball the most simplified methodology that I could come up with was how to get the bat most precisely to the ball with the shortest amount of time, the shortest amount of energy, and definitely the minimum amount of elimination or lo loss of accuracy. Yep. Yeah. And, and so those are all the factors that are in the book, Roger. I don't want to go into uh, any more detail on that, but what I want to ask you is, is critically important to Six Sigma practitioners that go through this structured process, which helps people identify the right defects, take the right measurements, um, analyze it for the right root causes, and then fix it just like you've done by saying, we're gonna change the swing path, we're gonna eliminate the stride, we're going to lower the bat, we're gonna create this access so the batter thinks differently about batting. But the most important part to me is that now that you've actually solved the problem, quote unquote, you need to go prove that you've solved the problem statistically. How did you do that and what were the results? Yeah, that's a, that was a, actually very remarkable to me. When I had, uh, in the measurement phase, I took four high school ball players and I measured their hitting and I categorized their hits into three types of hits, type one, type two, type three. Mm -hmm. Type one was a line drive. Type two was a decent hit. Type three was a pop-up or a grounder. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I measured two of those players on live pitching and I used two of people on uh, batting cage uh, pitching machines. Mm -hmm. After I made the improvements, I went back to those four players. I showed them what the improvements and the changes to the process would be. I only did that in 15 minutes or less. I mean, they literally, that's the only amount of time they had to learn about what I had changed and what were the differences. And so they, when they were doing the new process, they were doing it without perfect execution. Sure, sure. It, so and just to was, add a little bit it, more I, uh, uh, flavor to that, when Tiger Woods changed his swing on golf in order to come back from the greatest player to non-arguably the greatest player ever to play golf, it took him a year to change his swing. So it's not yeah. a small task to change a swing. The benefit that we have here, though, is, is that baseball has not been addressed by a Six Sigma type of approach. And so we have the benefit of getting the low-hanging fruit. Right. Okay. So right. Right. this is one of the unique aspects, and that's why I, uh, you know, talk about in the book and, and in general. This is just for me stage one. There, there's going to be right. at least a stage two so and maybe a stage. What were the results? Okay, on the results, 
uh, when I remade, I took the same after 15 minutes or less of training time, I took those four people back to the batting cage or the live pitching and remeasured their hitting using the best they could the implementation of the new process. Yeah. What happened was is all four players improved. The average improvement, or, well, I shouldn't say that, the individual improvements ranged between 20% and 42%. The average improvement was over thirty percent. The average so improvement to me, was thirty percent. So if somebody's batting a uh, a two fifty, what would that bring them up to? Three twelve. Wow! And suddenly they're making a million more per season. <laughs> that ta and that takes a three fifteen hitter to a four hundred hitter. We have a lot of three fifteen hitters. We don't have any four hundred hitters. Yeah. I shouldn't say we have a lot. We have some three fifteen hitters. All right, so uh, so I want to know: Are those four players actually using the pivotal swing today in their in their games in their practice? Have they changed the way that they operate? Well, three three of them I don't know about because they they're they were just people that uh, at the time were uh, friends that my son son had, and I don't even know where they live or anything now. Okay, uh, the answer to that is. Uh, my son is using it. He's he's actually uh, he's 26. He turned 26 this week. <laughs> uh, he's playing in a city league kind of thing, and he's using it. He he best he definitely believes that he's hitting better than he did before when he played in high school and stuff. He played after high school even some, but uh, is he is he a professional level player? Don't know. I I don't think I can say that. But the answer is you know he's definitely hitting better, and he likes what he has learned as a foundation for how to improve his hitting. Yeah. It, it, is he measuring his hitting? Does he know what he's hitting on, on a regular basis nowadays, or is he not playing on a regular basis in order to record that? He, they just starting a new season. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, he, he's never given me a number, so I don't know that. I, I, don't, uh, I don't try to pressure him on that particular thing. My main issue is, have you learned from the process improvement? Do you like the uh, results, and do do you use the new swing methodology instead of your old methods? And the answer is definitely yes. Yeah, you know, most people don't like change. Um, most people don't want to be changed, and then on top of that, most people don't like change. But it makes a lot of sense when you're, you know, holding the bat up here. You got to bring it down. You got to even it out. You got to make sure you're hitting. And you're saying just. Hold it down here and and uh, bring it forward. You don't have to make as many adjustments as you um, normally have to in baseball. You know, I I was uh, as I was reading the book, I was you know doing the stance myself, not taking a step, trying to shift my weight around the pivotal axis. And my five year old son, who's uh, started t ball last season, was asking me what I was doing, and I said, "Well, here's a new swing that we're going to teach you this year." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So let me get into the legal stuff, Roger. You've trademarked the phrase pivotal swing. A lot of business owners, a lot of authors trademark phrases. It's not a big deal. What I took exception to when when you reached out to me and uh, and said, hey, I've got this Six Sigma process that I applied to baseball was the patent that you applied for because the patent says that you own the process of this pivotal swing, of lowering the bat, of not taking a step that everybody in baseball does, of you know, swinging around this access, which means that if anybody wants to do that pivotal swing in the future, they are going to have to um, license that from you. Do I have the general understanding correct? That That is uh, de def definitely the kind of the general aspect. The key to me was uh, I did I did consider the aspect of just making it available to anybody. Mm -hmm. The problem was when if you if you give something away, it has no value. True. And I, 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 my dad taught me that and uh, the general perspective in business I learned over the years too was you really, you, if you give something away, everybody's just going to set it aside type right. of thing. So right. I, I wanted to maintain the concept of value. The second element is control. To me, when I made the decision to file for a patent, that made the decision for licensing an automatic decision. I, I had no choice because if you're going to have a patent in order to control the patent, you have to con control the usage of it. What I tried to do was to make it very, very simple for amateurs to get a license. Okay, tell me what they, that they is. They can just go to, huh? 
Huh? Tell me what that is, that process. So the, the, in the book, it, 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 it's there too, is you just go to the website mm -hmm. and for 10 bucks, you can get basically a license to use it for four years. And is that, so, and what's an amateur quote unquote? Uh, basically the definition is you're not making any money or earning anything from the process of playing the game. So as soon as you go to college or the college scholarships are involved or the pros, then, uh, then you're no longer an amateur. So kids in high school playing baseball, my five-year-old that I want to teach this swing to who's playing t-ball, those are amateurs. Yeah. And it's going to cost me one time $10 for a licensing fee or is that $10 per year or how does that work? Well, the, the way that my patent people uh, advised me to do it, they said set it up for four years. Okay. So for four years, literally somebody through high school, for example, is, is covered. Gotcha. And so uh, the idea there is is that uh, most most people are probably uh, you know technically would probably need to do it twice during their career, you know during little league and pony league, and then once more maybe at the time when they're in high school. But a lot of players fall out of the process by the time they get to high school. So mm -hmm. uh, you know those folks are not involved. But the thing that would really be upsetting to me is because uh, I truly believe that the younger players are going to benefit from this far more than the other players because their process is so radically varied that by just adding structure to their process they will improve dramatically yeah so i'm swimming upstream everybody that plays baseball for the past you know 100 years everybody that watches baseball you hold the bat up you take a step you hit it if i teach my son to use the pivotal i license by a license i teach my son to to use the pivotal swing so he's getting more hits in t-ball. He likes the game more. It's actually more exciting to play rather than, you know, uh, my son's really yeah. in it just for the just for the snacks that are after the game, let's be honest. Yeah. But now he's actually playing it more. He's getting more hits. He's being more consistent. He's he's reducing the variation in his hitting. Um every coach out there is going to say, "Hey Jake, you need to hold your bat up. You need to take a step. What do I do to combat that?" Uh, you know, I tried to address that in the book, and, and I, I know that that is an issue. And uh, when you mentioned about the players that I introduced this to in the past, that was the biggest problem they ran into was when they went back to their environment of playing in high school or the even after high school, they constantly were being barraged by coaches and other people of what the hell are you doing, you know? So right. they, and they didn't have the psychological will or the desire to stick to it to see the benefits. So they saw the benefits in their actual performance, right. and they had the numbers even, but they, they still that, had uh, the uh, difficulty pressures. with the issue of will and desire to carry through on solving a problem. Yeah, well, it's the social pressures and it's the norms, and people would rather be normal than be abnormal but actually have a better hitting average. The key that you uh, address to me, though, is, is that it's, it's exactly the same – that any project manager or any management ma effort would have when you're working with either a Six Sigma deployment or with a Six Sigma project. The number one thing is communication. To me, the book is the communication. It's, it's getting the, the information out there. The next aspect of that is the, in the implementation is the uh, acceptance, you know, the willingness to understand and um, there's going to be some ball players out there that want to improve. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, you saw in the book, I talked about the different players. Who's, who's most likely to be willing to look at a change? You know, the guy that's sitting on the bench is obviously going to be a lot more willing to look at how can I improve my hitting than the guy that's already, you know, in the batting order. Right. So, so I think that's the, the – then the next stage comes into the implementation and the L effectiveness of the implanta implementation comes to – you know, if a player is trying to do this and the coach doesn't understand it, then maybe uh, you know, it's going to take a little bit of a team effort, meaning you're going to probably have to talk to the coach and say, hey, coach, you know, I read this book and this stuff really makes sense to me and I'd like my son to be following this. Maybe yeah. you could read it too and see if you can, uh, you know, get on board and maybe we can help these guys be better hitters. Yeah. Have you thought about sending copies of the book to every single uh, coach, major league coach and, and hitting coach out there? Uh, the answer to that is I have sent it to 20 of the 30. And what, what's uh, been the response generally? I have not gotten a response from them. <laughs> this, this, is, this is where we talk about change, okay? Yeah. This is, this is a huge change for them. And most of them, 
I, I, uh, I don't know. Do you know the name Bruce Bochi? No. Bochi was the uh, coach for the pod or the manager for the Padres for many years. And it was actually during the time that I started working on this. But he moved up to San Francisco to be the manager for the Giants. Mm -hmm. But I approached Bochi way back. And I said, you know, we have these tools called Six Sigma. And we, I made a presentation to him. I had a couple guys with me that were, uh, you know, knowledgeable. And we, we basically had a little meeting with him and, and tried to convince him to be the sponsor of doing this effort. In yeah. other words, I wasn't planning at that time to do it on my own. I wanted to do it in conjunction with the Padres right. and literally make it a Six Sigma project working with the Padres. Uh -huh. But uh, he, he was very interested, but at the final end, he, he ended up not accepting the offer to, to work with us on it. Uh, so well, that's, 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 that's the shame. key is, is that coaches – all, all I'm look, I'm going to look for is the people that you know. As I get the book out there, mm -hmm. get it in front of people, uh, parents. You know, to me, I as a parent could read that book, and I know I could help my son be a better hitter from just reading the book. Mm -hmm. Now, how am I going to deal with the coach and those kind of issues? I'm going to maybe buy a copy of the book yeah. for the coach too, or right. I'm going to let him borrow my copy and and that type of a thing because I think that's. The only way that you're going to keep the momentum is is that you got to have reinforcement to the execution of the method. Well, and, and people, if they uh, they at least need to be exposed to it, so that if my yeah. son's batting, they're not going to try and recorrect it. If people yeah. want to go out and buy the book, uh, they can do it. It looks a little bit different than this uh, since the time that that you provided a copy, Roger. It's been picked up by Teat Publishing. You told me. Uh, yeah. If people want to buy the book, they can buy it on Kindle ebook for nine ninety nine. Go to Amazon, type in Pivotal Swing, and it's there. Um, they both, also... on, on Amazon on Amazon both versions are there. Oh, I didn't see the the uh, imprint. Great. So Amazon yeah, both it's, versions it's there now. are there. The print is fourteen ninety nine. Fourteen ninety nine. All right, and I'll have links underneath this video. They're not going to be affiliate links. I'm not providing them, uh, uh, you know, to try and make money. I'm providing them as a service to people who are truly interested in learning and evaluating changing the swing of themselves, of their kids, uh, what have you. If you have a follow-up question, please post it in the comments below this video and we'll ask Roger to come back and answer as many as he can. Also, if you wanna follow Roger and The Pivotal Swing on Twitter to find out what's changing, who's using it, what the results are, you can do so at Pivotal Swing. Roger, if somebody wants to contact you to learn more, uh, is there an email address that you prefer? Yeah, uh, roger at pivotalswing.com. Easy enough. I'm going to urge yeah. the audience right now, like I do every single interview, if you receive value out of this interview, please take a moment to say thank you to Roger. It's as easy as posting a, a tweet with at Pivotal Swing. Uh, roger, I enjoyed your video. I'm going to think about implementing it, or I bought the book, or shoot him an email and tell him what you thought. Roger yeah. Hart, author of Pivotal Swing. Thank you for coming on the I6 Sigma show, sharing your knowledge of baseball and Six Sigma and your passion for both and helping others become more successful change agents, business leaders, and athletes. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time.